begin our service in your bulletin on page three or in your book of common prayer pages 355 three five five blessed be god the father the son and the holy spirit and blessed be his kingdom now and forever amen almighty god to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Bends the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you and also with you let us pray 
Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have made, given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. The first reading is from the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish, such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky and those who lead and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 16, and we'll read responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is the one who and are in the land, the one those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer, nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. <laughs> my God is the blessed land. Indeed, I have a godly heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body shall also rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let me sorely see it. Uh, you will show me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory be, Glory be, to, the be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second reading is from Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 14. 15 through 18, and 19 through 25, a reading from Paul's letter to the Hebrew. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifice that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For a single offering he has perfected for all time, those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart 
in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The sequence hymn, Morning Has Broken. Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, according to Mark. As he came out of the temple, one of his, of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another and all will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign that these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Alleluia. 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 God is with us. 
God is with us. God is with us. The temple in Jerusalem was the foundation of the Old Testament Judaism. It was the Old Covenant. In the New Testament, what is that foundation? What is the new temple and the new covenant? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 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 Please be seated. So today's gospel was a difficult one for me to write on. And the reason is this. It really and truly does not have a clear theme. And the passage cannot stand alone by itself. See, in order to understand today's gospel fully, we have to take it in context to everything that happened and compare it to everything that happened in that week, last week of Jesus' life. So really and truly to understand today's gospel, we have to start back at chapter 11, which takes us from Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem through a series of conflicts in chapter 12, which follows through to this apocalyptic chapter 13. But we can't stop there. We have to continue reading all the way to chapter 16, where we encounter the crucifixion as a resurrection. It is hard to pluck this chapter out of Holy Week and somehow understand what Jesus is trying to tell us here. We must look at Holy Week as a whole. So, of course, as I said earlier, this is Jesus' final week, his final earthly week of ministry. It is crunch time. Jesus is in full cry now, and the Pharisees are in full attack. The Sanhedrin has teamed up with the Herodians, and they're planning and plotting to put him to death. It is quite clear that the events in chapters 11 to 12 are the foundation for what's teaches, what Jesus is teaching us here today in chapter 13. So Jesus has made it publicly clear all week that the religious system of Israel is so corrupt. It is corrupt to the core. that he's now telling the disciples that they can expect this corruption to bring forth a cataclysmic event. So last week, we started, we met Jesus in the temple teaching about the widow's offering. And he said this in front of the treasury where all of the believers came and put their money in. And this same treasury that was used to fund the upkeep of the temple. And in that meeting last week, Jesus said in front of all the well-to-do that this poor widow's offering was more acceptable in the sight of God than their offerings. Those well-to-do people were the religious elite. And so they weren't happy with that comment. But Jesus' comment continues to go on and he, he continues to fuel rage directed between himself and them. And the religious leaders are going about trying to find ways, as I said, to get rid of him. And so today's gospel continues throughout that thought that Jesus was talking about in the temple. And is how that temple is the importance the central important place in the Jewish religion at that time. So today's gospel begins with Jesus leaving after he made those comments. He's leaving the temple. And quite frankly, it is, it is his last time going into that temple. It is his last time visiting that building. And most scholars interpret this words that he says now as him breaking all establishments, all contacts with that temple. And so as he's leaving and his disciple says to him, look, teacher, what large stones, what a large, beautiful building. So can you just imagine the pride? I mean, at first you think they're nothing but you know, country pumpkins coming to the, the city for the first time, seeing the temple. And they're like, oh, wow, what a beautiful place. You know, you can go to New York and anytime you see one, they tell you in New York, you can tell the, all the tourists, they're the ones looking up. So you can, you, you, at first glance, you're thinking, Okay, what are these country pumpkins talking about? But this is not their first time in the temple. This is them with pride pointing out to Jesus, even after what he said 
that look at our beautiful temple. Look, teacher, what a grand place. So you can just imagine their pride, but you can also imagine the pain in Jesus' heart as he looks up at his father's house one final time. You see, the temple complex was indeed a marvelous sight. Herod had begun construction of this new temple in 20 BCs, and the workers had continued finishing the touches up to 50 years up to when Jesus had come to visit. And Jesus' father, Joseph, his earthly father, has been rumored to even work on that temple during the years that they stayed in Bethlehem. So the, the temple has some meaning to Jesus, right? It is the place where he himself had been many a times. And the temple, of course, is located on a mountaintop. It's a huge con construction. And Josephus, the historian, reports that the wall surrounding the temple was stadium length. So that's about 607 feet he's talking about. The temple was 100 cubits wide or 150 feet wide. And it stood, its wall stood 100 cubits high, which in today's terms is a 15 foot, 15 story building. Outside its four wall, inside its four walls, it had 45 acres of bedrock mountain that was shaved flat by Jewish hands. And in Jesus' day, it could easily hold over a million people in there. Archaeologists have uncovered stones that were as large as 42 feet by 11 feet by 14 feet and weighed as much as 500 pounds. Josephus, the historian, tells us that the largest stones at the base of the foundation now buried were even bigger than the white marble. The white marble that adorned the outside was gilded in gold and reflected in the sunshine. And it had silver and crimson and purple and polished cedar on the inside with great columns supporting the high ceiling. It was considered one of the wonders of the world. So you can just imagine it was the pride of Jerusalem. Even more significantly, it was the pride of the Jewish people. And it was the place where God made his earthly home. And even today, as we go and we look at that last section, the weeping wall that Jews and pilgrims go to all through the year, we can see how massive that's that one little structure is and how massive we can imagine that whole thing may have been. And as I describe this structure, I myself am filled with awe of how big it may have been. So you can just imagine the pride of the locals and the pride of pilgrims as they came in. But on that day, on that fateful day, pride was not what Jesus was feeling. This was the same temple that he had debated scholars in at age 12. This was the same temple where Jesus had earlier quoted the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah and said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer to all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And then he grabbed vines and he drove the merchants out in order to cleanse the house of his father in heaven. But now he continues to quote Jeremiah where he says, do you see those great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. It will be all thrown down. Can you really just imagine the pain in his heart of having to say that about his father's house? Can you imagine the pain of foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple? And that because that destruction was going to happen for the same reason that it happened two times before, God's chosen people had become wicked and corrupted. God had destroyed it before and he was going to destroy it again. God chosen had not learned. So 40 years after the death of Jesus, his prediction did indeed come through. And in the year 1780, the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, the, the Roman emperor, as the Romans took and sacked the city. It completed the task of the old passing away and the new being born. It was the end of the old way of worship for not only the Jews, but Christians alike. For no longer would there be a temple building to center worship. The new worship for God's people will be centered 
on the Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God. And the new temple of God, the foundation of this temple, will be built in a new place where people can encounter God fully. My brothers and sisters, we are the temple of God. And the foundations are built in our hearts because we, we believe in Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. And because of our beliefs, the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit will come and dwell in our hearts and will come and build the foundations of his temple there. My brothers and sisters, do you believe in the Christ? That's not a blind question. Do you believe in the Christ? Yes. Okay, good. We're awake. So as long as we believe in the Christ, God will build his foundations in our hearts. When we believe in Jesus the Christ, we, the people of God, become the temple, and the Holy Spirit comes and lingers in us. And the Holy Spirit will enter into us, no longer into a city and building or a temple, but it will build his temple in us. Rather, the new temple and the new dwelling place is each believer's heart, regardless of where he or she is, regardless of what building he is in, regardless of what we're doing in life, God is in here. As Paul said in his, in his writings in 1 Corinthians, do you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit now lives in each and every one of you? You, my brothers and sisters, are the temple of God. Is that not good news? Is that not the good news to hear this day? Good. But that is the news of this passage. And that is what Jesus is trying to tell us. And even as we go through this COVID epidemic, and we really learned that this building is not the church. Did we experience that, that our, our prayers and our, our, our worship continued without the building? Did it not? Right. So we learned that firsthand now. And that we understand that we, the people of God, are the church. This building is where we worship. This building is where we come to commune. This building is where we come to get nourishment. But this building is not the church. You and I are. Our hearts are the temple of God. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the good news. But unfortunately for Jesus, anyone prophesying or regarding the destruction of Jerusalem always met with opposition from powerful people. In the Old Testament, the authorities, angered by Jeremiah's prophecy, imprisoned him in a cistern and left him there hoping he would drown. And they hoped to kill him, but they relented when he reminded them that Micah had made the same prophecy. And they were so revered by Micah, they took him out. And then King Joachim also killed another prophet, Uriah, when he made similar prophecies. And so, Whenever someone prophesied in Jerusalem that the temple would be killed, it was very, very risky business. So in the end, this prophecy, this prophecy that Jesus made on this day, this last two days on earth about the destruction of the temple will play a significant role in his crucifixion. And as a matter of fact, when Jesus was brought up to trial, the formal accusation against him will be, we heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Now, of course, we know this is a twisted version of what Jesus really said, but once more the prophecy was held against a man of God and used to kill him. When will we learn? In today's world, people become offended when we say, the body of Christ, the temple of God is in us. Many Christians have encountered hardships for proclaiming our beliefs and faith in the risen Christ. But Jesus gives us hope and he warns us in his gospel about that. When we read, when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when all of this will be. Now, the Mount of Olives stands across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem, and it commands a grand view of the whole city 
and frames the temples for everyone to see. So here framed in this view opposite the temple in geography and opposite the temple in theology, Jesus stands with his disciples. And in that standing time, he tells us, he answers his disciples, not the question that they ask him of when will it happen, but he answers to them why it happens. He warns them of all the, all the messianic pretenders. And after Jesus' death, many pretenders did indeed arise, claiming to act as the Messiah or acting in his authority or being the Messiah and saying, I am he. But Jesus' answer focuses again, not on the reason, but on why it happened. And that's what he's trying to get them to focus on. Don't be worried about when, be worried about why. In today's world, not all messianic pretenders are religious. All sorts of people claim to have the answers to our deepest desires and our deepest needs. There, we can go through politicians, fitness experts, talk show hosts, uh, what, financial advisors, plastic surgeons, and of course, there are these multiple celebrities who claim to know better about the good God that they serve. They often are magnetic personalities who twist Christianity into a crossless religion. They tell us that the road to eternal life is smooth and broad. And if we follow the instructions, all will be good. And in the end, what happens for the good ones is that they in turn end up being enriched by our donations. But at the worst, we can all end up in destruction. And I have only to remind you and mention the names like Jim Jones of um, Jimstown and David Cornish of Whit Whitco and Barney Nettles and Marshall Applewhite of Heaven's Gate. And those people who told their followers, we are the light, we are the new messiahs, follow me and all will be well. And we saw what happened to them. Too many of today's nouveau religions simply pretend that there's no darkness in life. There's no shadows to hide. So the ever smiling preachers simply tell us, all is good, follow me. But in this gospel today, our Lord and Savior is not a smiling preacher. And he implies, and he lets us know up front that the road to salvation is not an easy one. That we, my brothers and sisters, will not be walking on beds of roses all the time. He tells us, beware of the false messiahs. They bring you nothing but a trap. The gospel of Christ acknowledges the darkness and acknowledges the hard times in our lives. And in today's gospel, Jesus is no smiling preacher, but he's telling us there is no bed of roses. He said, but in a few days, in a few days, I will experience full extent of human darkness. But our Lord and David would be persecuted and he would be ridiculed. He will suffer humiliation and eventually be executed for his preaching. But in the end, in the end, brothers and sisters, he overcame all of that. While experiencing the worst of human darkness, Jesus' life ministry will become a shining light amidst the evils of our day. Jesus' ministry will grow in inner strength and peace, a ministry that focuses completely on the human heart, as the human heart, as the temple of God, a ministry focused on a new covenant with Christ that has never been with a building. No matter what building we build, how beautifully constructed, what beautiful architecture, what wonderful glass windows we put on it, will ever be the temple of God. For the temple of God is living within us. So my brothers and sisters, as we celebrate these last days of Pentecost, and as we prepare for Thanksgiving, and as we prepare for Advent, let us present our bodies as the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, in which our spiritual worship is centered on the living God being within us. Let us understand and renew our hearts that God has made his foundation in us, that we would be able to understand and be all that is good and acceptable and perfect in God's sight. So that in the end, 
the temples within our hearts will be the light in the world, a light that someone else can follow. Let us be that temple. Amen. In the name of God, the Father, and God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Let us reaffirm our faith by saying the Nicene Creed found in your bulletin or on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For prayers of the people, we will use form six found in your bulletin or on page 392 in the Book of Common Prayer. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. Our families, friends and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who will visit the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, and William, our bishop, and all other ministers, especially Canon Wynne and Father Raddins. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. May God continue to guide this conversation, this congregation as we come out of this pandemic of COVID. Continue to hold us all in our hearts and help us to continue to worship in your holy name. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. As we go into this last two weeks of Pentecost and, and as we head into Thanksgiving, we thank you, God, for family. And may we all, when we meet together, under your name, be blessed by your holy word. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life. 
to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also you. Let us greet one another in peace and love. Oops. God's peace is good reflex. <laughs> Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus is the name. Jesus is the name. Jesus is the name. Jesus is the name. Jesus is the name of the Lord. Followed by the announcements. Good morning, Christ the King. Good morning. Good morning. I greet you in the name of Jesus. We welcome you and we're glad that you have joined us in person and online. We hope you feel a sense of connection as we share this time together. There are many other opportunities to get involved with Christ the King, even remotely. So to learn more about membership, baptism, or confirmation, or to receive emails about upcoming Christ the King Episcopal Church events, visit us at www.christthekingnj.org or email us at ctk at christthekingnj.org. And we will be happy to help you in any way that we can. We ask that if you are a lifelong Episcopalian from another faith tradition, exploring your faith, or just visiting, you are welcome to join in worship. And please remember that it is advised that if you attend physical service, you must wear a mask. This is required by the Diocese of New Jersey. Also understand that there is an uptick in the COVID virus, so therefore, um, it is important that we sort of like stick to what the guidelines are and remember not only yourself, but family members, friends, and your neighbors. The Men of Christ the King uh, monthly solidarity meeting has been scheduled for next Saturday, November 20th, 2021 at 10 a.m. on Zoom. All men are required to attend this important meeting. Please see the Zoom link in the bulletin. Bible studies on Mondays, as well as Wednesday prayers have resumed, and this is by Reverend Sheldon Raddix. Or do calendars. They are available for only $3. Please contact Linda Anderson for purchase at 
10:50, or leave a message with the church office. Those calendars are really good because they do show you what the service is each week and what the um, scriptures and the um, Psalms are. There is an, a message in the bulletin from the New Jersey Department of Health. If you, if you have received your second dose of Pfizer six months ago and are 65 or older, a long-term care resident, an adult with underlying medical conditions, or an adult at increased risk of COVID-19 exposure because of your job, you are now eligible for the Pfizer booster shot. If you have a friend or a family member that meets the above criteria, or would like more information um, on the eligibility and assistance in finding a nearby location to receive the booster dose, you can call 855-568-0545 or go online to covid19.nj.gov slash finder. The 20 I'm sorry, 238th Dyson Convention will be a one-day hybrid meeting on March 5th, 2022. So please, in the bulletin, take a look at all the important dates that are available. Please read the detailed article about the Episcopal Volunteers form airport welcome teams for Afghans arriving in Oklahoma City. It is a very extensive bulletin. And I think that when um, Daniel takes the time to put these detailed articles in the bulletin, when you have some time, please try to read them. You don't have to print it out. You can read it right on your computer. So why should I pledge? Because it's stewardship. There are many reasons to pledge of which the following may help you to determine whether to pledge or not. It is an important part of your faith journey. It is a promise to your faith community. It is active witness. It helps the vestry develop a more accurate plan for the church year. And it helps you by providing the necessary record of donations for a tax deduction. If you have not submitted your 2022 pledge card, please complete the copy attached and submit it to the church office. Thank you for supporting Christ the King. There is another detailed uh, um, article in the bulletin that the Episcopal Delegate to COP26 Climate Conference share lessons of hope and struggle with the church. So it is a two page article. So please remember to read that. Let's not forget our one warm coat drive. Help those in need this winter. Christ the King by supporting our first One Warm Coat Drive. It runs from November 1st to December 15, 2021. Please bring new or nearly new coats for men, women, or ch children in all sizes for a donation to local nonprofit organizations. Now is the time to get back for all the blessings we have received. Donation boxes are located in the Guild Room. The donations will support the following nonprofits, Trinity Cathedral Food Pantry Outreach and Catholic Charities of Burlington Community Access Center. So this is brought to you by the um, Christ the King Parish Life Committee. An important announcement from Dr. Joe, please, um, Note that all choir members that you will be meeting at 9.15 a.m. next Sunday, November 21st, for a rehearsal before service. You are to wear your Black Jesus shirts. So Christ the King, I leave you with this message as we are going through stewardship. It is from Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Christ the King, have a happy, blessed, safe and healthy week. Don't forget, wear your mask, socially distance. Thank you.
offer to the Lord a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and make good your vows unto the Most High. The offertory hymn is Lord Christ when first thou cometh.
Praise God for all whose these blessings flow. Praise him, O, o teachers here below. Praise him above these heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of the light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, who forever proclaim this hymn, whoever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy. Holy, 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 holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, of the Lord. Hosanna in the Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share in our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offer himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of your redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death and resurrection and ascension, we offer to you these gifts. Sanctify them with your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your son, the holy food and drink, of new or ending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive the holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And in the last day, bring us forth with all your sins into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask you 
to Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Christ our Passover is sanctified for us. Christ our Passover is sanctified for us. Christ our Passover is sanctified for us. Take away the sins of the world. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts 
by faith with thanksgiving. Course, the distribution of communion will happen at the end of service. What Christ is perfect. The bread of Christ is the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The communion hymn is hymn number 245 in the LEV, 245. That's what I was just about to ask you. So, before I do, so do special prayers.
Let us pray for all of those who have birthdays to stay. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, for all your servants that are beginning another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For all of those who are traveling, O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who are traveling, especially at this time where Thanksgiving is coming. Surround them with your loving care and protect them that, from every danger and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray to God for our local governments. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send down those who hold office in the state, in the commonwealth, in the cities, and in the towns. Give them the spirit of wisdom, clarity, and justice. And that with steadfast purpose, they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May God, I ask you this time to lay your hands on this congregation. Help us, dear God, as we approach this season of Advent and Thanksgiving that you guide and protect each one of its members. Guide us, dear God, in our hearts, in our minds, that we may understand, dear God, that you have put your Son and Savior in the form of the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Help us, dear God, to, to nurture that growth and that oneness with you, and where we be a light in the world, guiding more people to your eternal kingdom. I ask these things through your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. May we continue with the post-communion prayer found on page 14 of your bulletin and page 365 in your Book of Common Prayer. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit Keep you and remain with you always, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. The recessional hymn, hymn number 525, The Church Has One Foundation. The church has one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is a new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. He led from the and elect from every nation, yet one of earth earth. Her to her 
affection, one faith, one love, one birth. One holy name she blessed, partakes the holy food. And no more knew her, not printed. <laughs> Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.